I want to introduce to you a term that I think would be uh, a bit explanatory, at least it helps me to explain what it is we're really talking about. The term is converging powers. What is the universe? The universe is a converging power. What is creation? Creation is made up of converging powers. Everything in creation I see is a converging power. Good, bad, God, Satan, whatever it is, there are converging powers that are working. You were made especially as a believer to reach certain intents and purposes. For instance, uh, Ephesians 1 and uh, where is it? I think it's verse 10. Ephesians 1 and Now, Ephesians 1 and 5 says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And there is another uh, instance of this in this same first chapter where he uses the word pleasure. The, the believer is birthed by God to first give God pleasure. We're back to Ephesians 1 and 4, first line, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. We are God's pleasure. That's why he chose us. That's why the word chosen sticks out. He put effort and thought and purpose into this idea of his. He built into it. Every one of us have purpose for our life because we were chosen to be in Christ. So we were made to be his pleasure. Uh, not only this, you were made to fit into this world. Fit. You were made to fit into this world. <laughs> That's why we were made flesh. Because we fit into this world. That's the created part of us. The created part of us has distinct identification with all creation. That's why the created part of us is going to be done away with too. These bodies, they, sh they shall pass. Our new body is a glorified body that fits our spirit, but this body that was created will be done away with. We were created literally out of the dust of the ground, and we'll go back to dust. It'll be done away with. So everything that is in creation has compatibility, but everything that's created will be done away with. Nothing created will continue. There's not one thing in this created world we're in now that will be kept. So that doesn't mean that what is created is Christ. There's no sense or sign of pantheism in it. It isn't that created things are Christ, but it means that he has to do with it. All things were created by Christ and for Christ, and subsist because of Christ. Doesn't mean that it is Jesus Christ. So every creature was made to fit into the world. Now the best way to, to see that is that God's purpose for this believer is that the world become known to him as a schoolhouse. Don't forget that. 
The world is a schoolhouse. It is nothing but a schoolhouse. It is nothing but a teaching training place. It is not where we're going to continue. It is not what we were chosen in Christ to ultimately be worldlings. We were chosen to be sons of God. We were chosen in Christ, which is eternal life dwelling in us. And so we were made to fit into this world. Turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Let us read some verses of Scripture here where the Apostle Paul gives us the ramifications for men living in this world. Beginning at verse 22, Acts 17, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive in all things that you're too superstitious, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. That's a good statement there because they were worshiping the God that didn't know. That's what most of us did for a lifetime. We worshiped the God we didn't know, so we mustn't fuss at these Greeks. Verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing he is the Lord of heaven and earth. Now, you mark that as a lordship statement. That's one of these lordship statements, total everything. Total everything. Later on, over in uh, Colossians 1, which we just looked at, the Apostle Paul's going to define that, how God made the world and all things therein. How did he do it? It's made for Christ, by Christ, and consists only by Christ. The Lord of heaven and earth dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed it anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, far to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Now it says 26 verse that uh, we need to give some explanation to. This 26 verse says that God has put every man on this earth and has determined first their times. And second, their bounds of habitation. Now, we don't usually mention this until uh, the fellow's dead. That's right. <laughs> we don't... We don't talk about God numbering our days until they're numbered. But you don't hear it then. So you better hear it now. <laughs> God has set the times for your life in this world. Isn't that interesting? I make a point of that because I want you to see the futility of the idea you have of this world. You have the idea that this world is set against you and you must overcome it, and religion says we must make it better. And the only time we ever relent from those erroneous feelings is when somebody dies and we say, well, it was just the Lord's time to call them home. We all got that time. We got it now while we sit here. I mess around with my father every once in a while and say, I want to live to be 120. I got it in my mind, I want to be 120. I don't know why. I just like to outlive some of you. <laughs> but it, that doesn't really matter because I know that I'm in eternal life right now. I am an eternal person now. The real person I am is eternal. John said it in his epistle, beloved, now you have eternal life dwelling in you. I know I'm that. But I also know that this body, flesh, that I live in now, this house I live in now is 
numbered in its days. Because he said he had set the times, appointed the times of our living on this earth. That's the first thing he did, to show us the futility of believing that the world is set against us. It isn't. We are set in God's framework. Right now you're in God's framework. Don't wait till you're dead to figure it out. You're in God's framework right now. Move in it. Feel liberty in it. Every day is a blessed moment. Live it for the glory of God. Enjoy it. And quit worrying about tomorrow. That's what Jesus did when he came projecting men into the other dimension of life from created living to spiritual living, he very plainly said, take no thought of your life. Take no thought. Now, he said what Paul explains in the epistles. And so the first thing Paul says about this world is that God hath determined the times of all men on the face of the earth, and he has appointed that time. Now, I don't know that God has a chart up there where he's got the name Ernie written, 1999. <laughs> Squish him out. <laughs> I don't really think God operates like that. But I do think he has appointed the times of our existence on this earth, and that's a part of this world, and none of it is separated from Jesus. That's our point. The second thing is, he has set the bounds, determined the bounds of our habitation. We made a bit mention of this, I think, a long time ago in Institute, but we need to mention it again. That means that God has literally set the bounds of area where you are to live and have your being. You understand that? I'd like to move to Oregon some days, but I can't do that till God resets the bound to my habitation. My habitation's set in Dallas now. I go to Hawaii, I'd like to live in Hawaii. I go to Miami, I'd like to live in Miami. I'm fleshly. But God has set the bounds of my habitation. I don't have the right to get up and go as I please until I know that God has reset the bounds of my habitation. And if you'll notice, most people who go through life running from responsibilities never get it put together because they keep breaking the bounds of their habitation. All of us pretty near have a relative like that. And uh, they never get it put together. And notice they're always moving. Always going somewhere. It's always greener pasture somewhere else. I can, you know, if I go over there, I can get a job. Six months later, oh, I think I'll come back over here. I, I, I got a chance to get a job over here. God sets the bounds of our habitation. Our problem in functioning in life has to do with time and being. We're pressured because we don't rest in the fact that every day is the day of the Lord. And we don't be who we're supposed to be right where we are. But God has set the bounds of our habitation in this world. Why does he do this? Why is time and being pertinent to our relationship with the world? Well, verse 27 tells us. Why does God set our times and bounds of habitation? That they should seek the Lord. Mark it heavy. That they should seek the Lord. Why does God control the breath you breathe and fix your life in happiness only when you're in the bounds of habitation where you're supposed to be? That you might seek the Lord. Then what is the purpose of our function in this world? That we might seek the Lord. What does he mean by that? 
Find out who you are. You were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. The purpose of the creation of the world is that you might seek the Lord. What does that mean? That means that everything in creation is a converging power working on you. Why? So that you'll seek the Lord. Now that's a loaded verse, this 27th verse. You notice I'm just talking about the first line, that they may seek the Lord. That's what the world is all about. That's why you're on this earth. That's the only reason for you functioning in this world, that you might seek the Lord. Why? You were chosen in Christ. You've got to find out about that. You've got to come into that understanding and knowledge. That's God's intent. That's God's purpose. That's everything to you. So we've got a whole lot of apparent enemies that have kept us from that knowledge. Religion especially. Satan. But when we look at those, we see that those powers that seemingly kept us from this knowledge is the only thing that pushed us to it. Why? Sinners out here running around it's not in religion are not seeking after God. Who is it that's really seeking after God? It's those that are hungry to know God. Next line of verse 27 if happily they might feel after him. Now, I've got to tell you something. Why are you sitting in this room instead of us being down at the First Presbyterian Church in a big revival meeting? Or out here under a tent in a big miracle meeting? Why are we here? Because something in us caused us to seek after him. It's that something that made us want to know him. No reflection on the healer or First Presbyterian or anybody else. But what's different about us in this room? If happily they should seek after him. Happily. If you had a burning desire. If you wanted to know him. If you were sick and tired of those forces that was forcing you to be something that you felt contrary to who you are and that's what religion does to us it works on us until we feel contrary to who we really are so if happily if that moment ever come where you got so in earnest and so desires I've got to be honest with you I don't know how people handle this truth I think the thing that bothers me most of all about people who hear the message of Christ is that they treat it like any other thing they hear. How can we do that? How can we have the idea from the scriptures that there's another person in us? And us not turn the world upside down to find out about him, to make it work, to let him operate to us as us, beyond me, because I get so eaten up with it sometimes, I don't know how to handle it. I feel after him. I'll use his language. If he's in me, I know what it is to go day in and day out and never have the slightest feeling he's there. But the scripture says he's there. I know what it is to get in awful messes and never turn to him. But the scripture says he's there. I know what it is to fail God and to sin. But the scripture says he's there. I can't understand why I wouldn't want to give my whole life 
to learn of him, find out about him, to feel after him. But you see how Paul put it here? If they've translated this good, and it appears they have, he puts an if there. Why well, Paul says, there's going to be a lot of people that don't feel after him at all. That's what that if says. That there's going to be some that don't care. If happily, they should feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. And here's a confusing statement to many because he's speaking to sinners, unconverted, heathen. And he says, for in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. I don't believe that you're in Christ unless you're born again. So what we believe he speaks of here is being in the world, this world made by him and for him. And that not even the sinner escapes the fact that he has been chosen in Christ. And that when he hears the gospel, he has obligation to seek after him. But I want you to get the message that not everybody's going to seek after God. It'll be the same in our day as it was with Paul, that there'll be some that don't have that burning desire, or if they have it, they wash it out. It doesn't grip them. I said here tonight, and could tell you that I can give you enough money to solve all your problems. It wouldn't touch what I say to you that you have Christ in you right now. And if happily, if by burning desire you should desire to know him more than anything else in life, you would have life fixed in this world so that your whole movement would be in him. And by him, you'd never know separation again. No hurt, no pain could ever overwhelm. In fact, hurt and pain would be forms of joy to you if you saw him as he is. God, talking to you about another world, I'm talking to you about another dimension of living. I'm talking to you about how God made a world and by the things that are in the world, his intention is to shape men for his glory. The world is not out of control. I've said this so many times, but it needs to be put right here again. This world is not out of control. This world will not suddenly end. This world will not blow up. Men will not destroy this world. Jesus said it plainly. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. Now, did you ever analyze that little line? The worst days that have ever been on this earth were the days of Noah, where God destroyed 120 million people and saved eight. It's never been that bad since. And it's not near that bad now. Why? God has the world in control. Not out of control. It'll never get worse. This world will never get worse than it's already been. Now, of course, every generation thinks it's worse than there's been. Every group of Christians believe that there's more of the devil operating in their day than ever has been before. I've lived long enough to see uh, parts of two generations and they both thought they had the devil worse than the other. But the fact is, it's never been out of control. It'll keep on going. We have problems today that are awful. You got family problems. You got children problems. You got drug problems. We got pornography problems. 
We got political problems in our world, but the world is not out of control. And I'll tell you something else. It gets balanced every day. This universe will stay balanced. It'll not be destroyed until God's ready to throw it away. And he won't be ready to throw it away until two things happen. And one of them is till he gets Isaac's bride. That's the church. He'll get the church safe before he does anything with this world. And the other thing is, he'll get Abraham and Sarah straightened out. That's Israel. And then he'll throw this world away. Isn't that good news? A couple of women's holding up the whole thing. <laughs> Then he'll get rid of the world. In the meantime, it's not out of control. It's functioning just like he said it to function from the beginning. How my heart goes out to people who do not see Christ, as the scripture brings it out. Uh, the devastation some people in Southern California have gone through, just as a little example. I know of two different groups in Arkansas that left Southern California because it's going to fall off into the sea. Now, there may be earthquakes. Do you ever read what Jesus says? Wars, rumors of war, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, destitution. He listed off a whole bunch of things. But he said, none of this is the end. But he did say something very important. He said, and this gospel shall be preached into all the world, and then shall the end come. Isn't that interesting? You know what determines the end of the world? Preaching the gospel. You listen to some, you'd think it's the Jews. But you know what determines Israel, finally? It's the gospel. Why? They're going to all be saved that's left. How? They're going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, him whom they pierced. They're going to believe in. What determines this world? This word. What did John say? In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And the world was made by that word. How is it it's going to all come to the end? By the word. The word. That's why God's moving on people today as never before by seeing Jesus the word. We're not a collection of scripture verses here. You'd never hold still for my collection of scripture verses. I've had several of them. I wouldn't even know which one to choose right now. But we want to see the word because the word was in the beginning. And when Jesus rides against the armies of this world, he's not going to be a king, a prince, a power, a healer, a deliverer, a miracle worker. You know what he's going to have written across him when he comes on that horse? The word of God. Why? That's what determines the whole of God's plan. So the world's not out of control. It functions and operates just as God intended by the word of God. Now don't you see the importance of searching the scriptures and putting that word in your mind? And seeing Jesus as the word and all the little things we have to say about the word? Why? Everything in the universe is a converging power. It's a power that's uh, converging on us. So let's kind of make it look like this. At the center of your being, your life, your only nature, is Christ. But out here, 
Most unchrist life is you, believer. What you'd really like in life is to control Jesus because that fits the way you are in the flesh. It's hard to give up to Jesus. If you don't love it. I mean it's hard. And most of us don't know enough about love. So it's been real hard. Because believers come to me all the time and say, Well, I'm having a battle with my flesh. They're not having a battle with their flesh. They just don't love enough. Well, I just can't do what I want to do. Your problem is you don't know who you are. So what the whole intent and purpose of God is, is to press this believer to Christ. I first saw this in the early days of my ministry when I got a hold of Maxwell's books. Any of you ever read Maxwell's books? Yeah. I tell you, I got struck by his crowded to Christ book. And that thought always stayed with me. That's what life's all about, getting crowded to Christ. And that's where finally I saw that everything in the universe was a converging power. What is it doing? It's pushing this believer in his life to Christ. It's actually a God working in the world so that everything that happens to this believer brings forth Christ. You see, we had some fellows in the scripture got a hold of that. John the Baptist did. I must decrease that he might increase. It's Paul saying, I suffer the loss of all things for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. So what God is really doing is pressing this believer who is chosen in Christ and doesn't know it. Now, he's come into this world, and he doesn't know it. Most of us thought it was all a glorious, wonderful, happy time coming into this world. Maybe you need to mark a couple of verses, kind of help you. Go over to Job. <laughs> I mean, the Gospel of Job has a word or two to say about this. You need to mark these verses if you don't have them already there. They're good to mark. Uh, <clears throat> they may be it don't matter verses, but uh, mark them anyhow. Uh, Job uh, 5. Job 5. Job 5 and 7. Yet man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. Now, I don't understand all that, but it sounds good. <laughs> sure different. I do understand the one a little better over in Job 14 and 1. Job 14 and 1. I've always liked this one, one of my favorite. Man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. <laughs> no reflection on women. It's coming into this world. What is the purpose of God then? What is God doing in your life? He is pressing and crowding you to Christ. Now, are you beginning to see this? Have we talked all this time? We're over a year here now. Have we talked all this time and you don't begin to see that I'm coming to rest? I'm entering into that rest. I'm not bothered and troubled and upset like I was before I come to knowledge. What's happening to you? You're being pressed to Christ. He's there. He's been there all the time. He's been like an old man sitting in a rocking chair that you ignored. Now then, you're beginning to give him his place. Thus, God did this. He could not make you see Jesus and him get his ultimate of love. He couldn't make you. 
For what he did, when he created the world, he fixed the world to have to do with Jesus Christ. So that in time, everything that was in the world would be a force and a power converging on you. Pushing you to Christ. To what Jesus? Some Jesus that would heal you, some Jesus that would make you honest. No, that's religion. The converging powers is forcing you to the Christ that's in you. God can't make a union. He can't force a union. But he said, when I created this world, it's going to be for Christ and by Christ and nothing will exist aside from him. Because the world is going to be a place made. It's going to have trouble. It's going to have evil. It's going to have Satan in it. And everything in the universe is going to have to do with Jesus Christ because I want that creature to come to see Christ as his all. So what's happened is that in your life, you have converging powers working. You have several of them. One converging power working in your life is in psychological problems. I can't see. The psychological problems of life. That's a converging power. That's the things you don't figure out don't understand, can't get a hold of, wrestle with. You're going to have a lot of them. I don't like the word psychological and psychology because it means human nature, but I redefine it as human beings. Human beings are going to have these things to happen. That's a converging power in your life. In fact, when you first hear the message of the Christ life, an awful psychological thing happens to you. You either feel unsaved or ignorant or this preacher's dumb. <laughs> you, have a, you have a lot of different feelings, I'm sure. But the psychological powers in your life are converging powers crowding you to Christ. What are they saying? They're saying they're not answers for all these things. It don't matter to have an answer for everything. You don't have to have life all tied up in a neat package. That isn't what it's all about. So God's going to allow ideas and questions and thoughts to come for which you never have answers. And then some of you are going to be like me. I got hundreds of answers for which there are no questions yet. <laughs> so you're going to kind of feel like you're strange. You're different. You know what? I think there are a lot of people who walk away from the Christ life message because they can't handle the psychological aspect of it. I don't understand it. I don't see it. Well, I'm going to tell you a lot of things I don't understand. In fact, the thing that bothers me the most is when I run into a preacher says, now I understand all that. <laughs> That's just what I believe. I've always preached that. That's just what I, that bothers me more. And somebody says, well, I can't understand it at all. Because I think God has fixed in my life some things that I don't understand. Now you think about it for a moment. A lady came to me the other day and she said, I have three children. Said, I raised all of them the same. I treated them all the same. I thought I did. And she said, two of them are pretty good and said, one of them is a rascal. She said, I'd like to know why God let one of them go bad. She said, that bothers me no end. I said, quit worrying about it. Well, I can. It's my child. I said, don't worry about it. There may be no answer. Except God working. A lot of things there's no answer for. 
woman the other day who had had a miscarriage and lost a baby said to me, she said, there's a lady down the street here that has 12 kids. Said every time she turned around, she has a kid and said they don't support them, don't feed them right, and don't take care of them. And said, here I can't have one. She said, I'm mad at God. You can always have things you don't understand. I don't understand how brown cows eat green grass, give yellow butter and white milk. <laughs> you ever stop to think about the disciples following Jesus, what a psychological test that was? I figured out why I have the Beatitudes. Blessed are ye, blessed are ye, blessed are ye, blessed are ye. I know why he finally said that. Because he had a gang following him that had left boats and, and mortgage companies hanging and, and families. Uh, didn't even get to tell their families goodbye. Uh, that was something what he put them through because he didn't let them stop from the time he called them. He said, come on, follow me. And if you don't follow me, forget it. So they had to do it or not forget it. And then finally, he saw them wrestling with all these things one day. How is it we can follow him? How can we be godly? I didn't tell my wife goodbye. My child had fever that day. Somebody ought to be taking care of him, wondering what's happening to him. I can think of all the things that went through their mind. And finally, he got them in a mountain apart, Scripture said. Set them side aside, and he spoke to his disciples. And the first thing he did was say, blessed are you. That's how the Beatitudes came in. Because he had some fellows under the greatest of psychological stress. I wish somebody would tell that Shula fellow that because if I ever saw anybody mess up the Beatitudes, he has. <laughs> Psychologically, they had problems. We're going to have them and they're not going to always be answers. You ever think of the relationship of Jesus with his mother, Mary? That, that uh, uh, at least two of the times that we have a confrontation between he and her, where the king of Galilee and finally at the cross, it looks like he rebuked her both times. The stress that was there was not to be relieved. She was to come to know him as her very life. Have you ever given little thoughts like that? Any time? There's a couple of people in the scripture that had a devastating task with Jesus Christ as their life. Wasn't hard for Paul. I don't believe he ever had anything to do with Jesus of Nazareth. So for him to get a revelation that Christ was his life and that the spirit of Christ had been put in him by a birthing, birthed in him by being born again, wasn't hard to take. But Mary, the mother of Jesus, finally had to accept Christ as her life. And one other fellow, that was James, the brother of Jesus, grew up with him, played with him, wrestled with him, ate with him. And finally one day, after he had been saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, had Paul to come along and say that same Jesus now lives in every one of us. That must have been hard for James to take. It had been a whole lot easier for him to be a man full of the Holy Ghost than to have somebody come along that you'd had such a relationship with in the flesh. And of course I say that because there are many of you who have had a relationship with Jesus in the flesh that makes it nearly impossible for you to accept him as your life. Because that's devastating. Because all you can think of is him in an outer form. Don't you know James thought of every fuss and every test and trial he ever had with Jesus? as a brother, and then one day to have to accept him as my only life and he's in me. That took revelation. You can't come along and teach that. That's why Paul said only the Spirit can reveal this to you. So there are converging powers of psychological stress, mind stress. <clears throat> God works through that. God works through that. 
lady said to me one time uh, down here in uh, Southern California in the hospital, she'd been prayed for by every healer had come along. So when the preacher told me this, he said she's hardened and she needs help. She can be helped. I believe she can be helped. She needs somebody to say something to her. And so I asked the Lord to give me a word. And when I took her by the hand, she's dying. It appeared with cancer. And I said, has anybody told you that Jesus is just as alive in you as he is in anybody on the face of this earth? All she thought of was a dying body. And the stress of it had separated her from God. But here... Jesus was in her and she was ignoring him. I said, very likely, the reason for your dilemma now is to push you to this Jesus. If you don't see him, you've missed the purpose of living. So get your mind off of a miracle and healing and let's first see Jesus. Trust him from within to give you a miracle. The stress is a tool of God. Now, we all do everything we can to alleviate it from speedy to whatever pill we're taking. Anything to alleviate it. But its purpose is to push you to Christ. Psychological forces in the world are God forces that have to do with Jesus. So what's your big problem tonight? What is it you don't understand? What is your wrestling over? Turn it around. Instead of your enemy, say, I see Jesus through this. I don't see Jesus as that, but I see Jesus through this. But we have these Stress things that are working. One of our greatest enemies today, today is depression and tension. We have stress, depression, and tension. Those are our three big enemies. And most every preacher you listen to say, that's a devil turned loose. No. It could be the devil. If it's the devil, you need to discern it and take authority over it. If it's not the devil, you need to see through it. And see, Jesus is your all. Is your all. Tension, stress, depression, or psychological problems that are converging powers put on us by God. Look at another one here. Uh, physical. Physical problems. Your physical problems are converging powers pushing you to Christ. And I need to talk very strong about this because so many of us don't know how to handle the healer in us. We think there's got to be a healer out here somewhere we go to. When it may be that our physical problems are meant to draw us to him, to see him, Two things about physical problems. One of them is that God's intention is that we see Christ as our life and begin to live that. Now you think I said something spiritual, but what I meant was physical. Do you know why most of us are sick? Because we don't take care of ourselves. We don't eat right, we don't live right. Now, the reason you're like that is because you're identified to other human beings. You're literally in union with other human beings. Doing what they do, living like they live, acting like they act. What is it you're not doing? You're not in union with him. Because if you were in union with him, he would take authority over this house he lives in. I'm not just talking to 
against you. I'm talking to me, all of us. What would we do if we knew Christ was in us? His wisdom would take care of how we lived in this world. What we eat, how we took care of ourselves, and what we did would make a difference. So what are our health problems? They're converging powers. They're trying to push us to the Jesus that's already in us. And I'll tell you what he does. He gives us wisdom on what to do and how to eat. A very obese person said to me the other day, I just can't do anything about it. The Jesus in me just wants to be fat. I said, are you sure about that? I said, you just fix that in your mind. Are you hearing his wisdom? His wisdom? Is your mind hearing what wisdom flows out of him? Because his, his purpose is that you have help. Brother John said, I wish above all things I might prosper and be in health. Great wish. Not many of us do it. But the Jesus in you doesn't mind you prospering and being in health. But that's not an outer thing you go do or do something to bring about. That's listening to him. That's living his life. Physical problems are converging powers on us, pushing us to a relationship with the Christ within us that gives us the knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding of how to live. You'll stop eating what's wrong for you to eat. You'll stop going where it's wrong for you to go. You'll stop living where it's wrong for you to live. You'll take care. You'll walk around as if this is the temple of God. God lives in this body. Now that's not going to give you eternal life in body. You're still going to get sick and will probably be carried out with some disease. But you'll begin to function like he intended that you function. Because physical powers are converging powers pushing us to Christ. We have another home problem. Only God could have worked out that problem. He's the only counselor I know who ever took two absolute strangers and told them to become one. <laughs> first thing I'd say to my kids is get to know each other first. You ever think about what God did to Adam and Eve? A fellow woke up one day and had a strange thing beside him. Never had been seen before on the face of the earth. And God looked at him and said, now y'all cohabitate. <laughs> Only God would have done that. That's far out. It is God that put two absolute different creatures together and said, now your objective is to be one. Well, right off the top, that appears to be impossible. <laughs> After five years, it's more than an appearance. <laughs> After 20 years, it may be blown all together. But it is God who said they could become one. How? Only by seeing Christ. What are home problems and marriage problems? They're converging powers pushing us to Christ. That's their purpose. That's why each of us are different. And the purpose of the differences between human beings is to crowd us to Christ. Because there's no way under heaven I can get along with you aside from Jesus. Any relationship cannot function long aside from Christ. 
business, church, home. Every relationship is contingent on somebody possessing a spirit and nature of love and bearing all in order to carry on. The home problems are converging powers. And if you're going through difficult times now at home and you've got home problems, children problems, God has fixed these in the world. You're not different. I mean, these, this man and woman finally cohabitated and had a couple of boys, and one of them killed the other one. Nothing new you have home problems. Start out like that. Why did God allow all that? Because they're converging powers to push us ultimately to this knowledge that we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Well, I'm going to talk more about this when we get in the next session. But I want to conclude with this thought. You ever think how important it would be to hear the true gospel every time you heard the gospel at all? And not get it mixed and commingled and polluted with a bunch of other ideas? How wonderful it would be to live to know only what is God's purpose in this world? You've struggled all your life to find the right job, the right mate. That's not the bigger thing. It's finding God's purpose by you in this world. And then the rest of it kind of falls into place. You get the right mate. You'll get the right job. Because once you see Christ as all, none of the rest of it matters that much. It fits in. It matters that it is right, but it doesn't matter that you're great or important. For instance, once you see Christ as your life and you see what your limitations are, you'll be happy at them. You won't be spending your whole life trying to do something that you're not because you see who you are and you've come to rest and happiness and peace at that point. And with that, we'll discontinue this session right here.